Hello, and welcome everyone. We are gonna get started in just one minute. I'm just going to allow those joining to connect to audio. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box. Let us know uh, where you're joining us from. All right, um, so let's get started. Thank you so much for joining us, joining us this evening for the second uh, webinar in our three-part series for offshore investing. Tonight, we are joined by Scott Picken and Rian Van de Pfeiffer, Van de, Van de Pfeiffer I apologize, Rian, um, to discuss compliance and regulation when investing offshore. With just a quick recap, on what we discussed last week, which was why you should invest offshore. Um, Scott will take us through that, and then we'll jump into how regulation and compliance works when you choose to invest or how you can ensure that you are protected. So Scott, if you want to go for it. Awesome, thanks very much, Gabby. Uh, wonderful to be back online with everyone tonight. And yeah, having helped investors from 158 countries invest a couple of hundred million dollars. I believe that there's four major things that they invest and reasons why they invest. The first is that they want wealth preservation. The second, and Gabby, if you can just click through the tabs, please. The second is that they want to have a plan B. And, you know, that's the whole philosophy of, you know, not just being in one country, in one currency or one asset class, but effectively having diversification. The third is that they want peace of mind. And again, diversification brings peace of mind because if you're in multiple assets across multiple countries, multiple currencies, and even multiple partners, then that provides you with, with peace of mind. And the fourth, and probably the one that resonates most, most with me is the word freedom. And really it's about becoming a global citizen. It's about not, you know, I don't care where you wanna live, where you wanna send your kids to school or university, you know, whether you want to donate money to the church, but what I do care is you having the freedom. And so those are the four overriding reasons why people actually invest. After we went through the why, and I explained my own why, we then went into the how. And if you look at the next uh, slide, you'll actually see here that, you know, Ray Dalio and, and a book that was written by Tony Robbins called Unshakable had four simple rules. We call them the four secrets don't lose money, asymmetric risk reward, tax efficiency, and diversification across assets, within assets, across markets and currencies, and across time. And Ray Dalio actually said, you need to make 15 uncorrelated bets in an attractive array of assets that don't move in tandem, and this will reduce the risk by 80% and increase your risk return ratio by a factor of five. Now, last week, we discussed this in more detail. It is a critical principle, and I believe that 20 years ago, it was impossible. But now, you know, unless you had a lot of money, now with technology, I truly believe that this is now possible. And we'll be going into this in more detail at the breakfast as well. Then we went into the how does it work? And I'm not sure, Gabby, if you want to do this part, um, but it's really just a simple marketplace. You've got quality institutional partners in the likes of Cashbox Global. Sorry, if you can just go back one. They list their products on our platform. You and I have access to global as global investors have access and then there's four simple steps which you can actually see as as you invest in the deal and you sign up in a compliant way you effectively complete your profile you fund your wallet and then you invest and gabby took us through last week in detail how to do this and again at the breakfast we're actually going to do an entire practical session so that you can walk away with results and that's the breakfast building around the country we are aware of COVID. We haven't done a live event in 18 months, but we thought that it's time. You know, some people are, are concerned around COVID and we completely understand that and, and we'll be taking all the necessary COVID precautions. But by the same token, people actually want to get face to face. They want to meet people and shake their hands and look them in the eye. And so we'll be holding breakfasts in Cape Town on the 1st of June, in Joburg on the 8th of June and in Durban on the 15th of June. And we'll talk more about that uh, once we've actually finished uh, tonight, tonight's session. And for those of you that are online in multiple jurisdictions around the world, we also will be looking to bring an online um, 
uh, opportunity later. But I think without further ado, Gabby, we want to get into what tonight's nuts and bolts are about. And so I'll hand back to you around uh, compliance and regulation. Great, thank you so much, Scott. Uh, and with that, I'm thrilled to introduce our Chief Compliance and Invest in Investments Officer, um, Rian. If uh, you can just say hello to everyone on this call and give us a brief um, understanding of your background and experience in the financial services industry. Right, Gabby, thank you very much and uh, welcome to um everybody that's attending it's a pleasure to be here tonight um so my background is um, i studied at um, the old rail or the um, university of johannesburg i obtained my bcom econometrics um, i started my journey in the financial services industry about 22 years ago and um, in alternative assets which is relevant to tonight's discussion uh, from uh, 2007 and my role as gabby has said um, that um, I'm Chief Investment Officer and responsible for compliance at Wealth Migrate, but I'm also wearing another hat where I'm a director and the key individual of what we call a Category 2 financial services provider, so in other words, a discretionary portfolio manager. And um, tonight is quite strange for me. I'm used to stand in front of people um, where I lectured um, in economic stats and accounting, at places like uh, UNISA, Mill Park Business School, um, and um, Technicon of South Africa. So that's my background in a nutshell, Gabby. Wonderful, thank you, Rian. Now I want to dive into testing that experience and start asking you a, bit of, a few questions about crowdfunding in commercial real estate and funding as a financial service. Uh, more specifically, I know that you were integral to uh, Wealth Migrate securing our Category 1 financial service provides in South Africa. Can you talk to us a bit about why it is so hard to be regulated in this space specifically? Yeah, so maybe just, um, I'm sure that everybody attending uh, the webinar knows what crowdfunding is, but basically it is where a group of people um, donate or, fin or invest um, smaller amounts um, into a project like a listed uh, a, a, we are funding a specific um, real estate project or maybe some other alternative assets like structured notes so within the south african context um, why it has been so quite difficult to be regulated is first of all in south africa you need to be regulated uh, for a financial product so for example you can do a pension fund, or you can do provident funds, or you can invest in shares, or you can do unit trust, or you can maybe do hedge funds, or whatever the case might be. And the problem is that property as an asset class in South Africa is not a financial product. So for the regulator, it was quite difficult to see, but as what must you be regulated? What will you be providing advice or an intermediary services on? So it was quite important for us to show to the uh, financial um, regulator, the FSCA, on a see-through basis that although our investors invest in real estate, they're actually buying shares in a SPV. So the moment we could show them or link what we are doing to a specific financial product, they suddenly understood that um, although maybe real estate is not a financial product itself, investors are buying shares and wait a minute, we can regulate these people. So just to go, go through that see-through principle made it easier for the regulator to understand. Furthermore, what you must understand is that for the regulator to regulate um, a financial service provider providing crowdfunding, they need to understand what the model is about. They need to understand the industry. So in other words, they need to know what's the checks and balances that they need to put in place so that they can. And furthermore, a further challenge is they need to take what we are doing in um, Wealth Migrate or Global Wealth Group, and they needed to fit it into current legislation. You know, so it's quite a challenge. And interestingly enough, what we're doing is not different to what 
in uh, within the regulate, uh, regulated space. So for example, crowdfunding is a hybrid model. And I'll give you an example. So you've got a platform where you are raising capital. You've got something that we called in South Africa, listed investment service providers, Momentum, Sunlum, Investec, where they also offer product on a platform. So the regulator had to understand, are we a platform or are we an administrator, for example? And also, since we are taking small investments and we're putting it together into an aggregation SPV, they needed to decide, but are we pooling? So isn't this a collective investment scheme? And those were the challenges that we had to face for us to get the regulation. And we are so grateful that you were there to take on those challenges, Rian, <laughs> for <laughs> us and to, to forge that path for, um, for our organization specifically. And I think that gives our, um, our audience tonight a very strong understanding of what it means to be regulated and, and um, specifically how they are protected as the investor in order for us to achieve and maintain this, um, this commercial or this, this financial service provider license. Scott, I see yeah. that you wanted to say something here. Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, I, I don't understand regulation. I'm not, I don't have the experience that Rion does. <clears throat> I have spent 10 years in the space trying to um, comply with the regulation. And, you know, we went as far as being one of the founding members of the African Crowdfunding Association back in 2015. And what Rion taught me was that when you bring in an expert that understands what they're asking, uh, both the language and, and the essence of what they're trying to achieve, you can then answer it and provide them with the peace of mind that they're looking for. So what we did, even though we formed the association and everything in between, we made very little progress in a six year period. And, and Rion managed to achieve it in, in about eight months. And um, again, it, it just shows always, you know, I always say there's two things to be successful, get the right information and get the right partners. And this is a classic example of getting the right partners who, who already had 20 years plus experience in the industry. Definitely, definitely. And, and so on that, just to talk through a bit more um, what we provide and how our compliance and risk management obligations, um, what they encompass. We do quite a lot within this business. There are quite a few areas that we touch. And by we, I mean mostly Rian and his, um, his small but mighty team, ensuring that we are compliant in uh, a number of different areas. That includes investor due diligence, investor verification. So for those who have not yet joined our platform, when you sign up to become a member, you will be asked to provide um, identifying documentation so that we know that you are who you are. That is a process called Know Your Customer or KYC. We also do extensive anti-money laundering checks um, on the investor as well, just to ensure that we're able to service you and provide for you dependent upon the country and the jurisdiction that you fall in, wherever you may be in the world. Um, we do extensive due diligence on all of our sponsors. Our sponsors are the um, institutions who are actually putting together the deals or the investment offerings that we present to our investors on our marketplace. And we'll dive into that just a bit later in today's session. We do extensive deal compliance, uh, deal level compliance and due diligence. Um, we do extensive compliance on money movement and ensuring that our client's money is safe while we hold it in a digital wallet. All of the structuring and setup for uh, facilitating that money movement and ensuring that you are invested in a specific offering, um, that your data is protected, and that we are adherent to all marketing and investor acquisition regulations globally. So it's quite a feat. Um, it's not something that uh, I think most organizations have the will to do at a global scale. We are one of the few. Um, but so that this audience has an understanding of what this encompasses. And Rian, I see that you want to just add something here. Uh, Gabby, yeah, I think... Um... One thing that I just want to mention to the participants is that money movement and holdings, uh, holding clients money compliance. Um, it's quite important in the sense that the cash custody or mm. the entity controlling investors' money is outside of the business. Um, so in other words, we've got external providers that's um, responsible to handle investor capital and we then just provide instructions and a compliance structure to ensure that the money can move from an investor into a deal. Absolutely. I'm really glad that you mentioned that, Rion, because I wanted to talk about next who our compliance partners are that support us in ensuring that we are um, 
beholden to and and in um, regulation of these these different um, governing bodies. So we have Alpha Cube Capital, uh, Lemonway, and Capital International Group. Can you just touch on these three compliance partners for for the audience? Yes, definitely. So in terms of Alpha Cube Capital, um, as you could see, that um, Wealth Migrate or Global Wealth Group's got the Category One financial services provider license, where Alpha Cube Capital's got a category two financial services provider license. So think of it as a license similar to Alan Gray, Old Mutual, Sunlum, that kind of thing. So it's a more comprehensive license. And Alpha Cube's responsibility is to ensure that the aggregation SPVs or the UK LLP are managed in a proper way. And it also gives a lot of um, peace of mind to service providers offshore that they are dealing with a um, company that's got the necessary checks and controls and balances um, in place to effectively work with investor capital. Um, so um, then let so Lemon Way um, um, sits in France, so they um, re regulate it in France in terms of EU uh, regulation. And Lemon Way is that company that does the cash custody. In other words, they, they provide us with wallets. They make sure that the client due diligences are done by us as a company. And more importantly, they make sure that money moves to a deal in a compliance manner or uh, in a compliant manner. Um, so um, an important part, um, sometimes a bit of a thorn in our flesh, uh, but that's what my team have to deal with. And then Capital International, you must think of them as a typical stockbroker in South Africa. Um, and Capital International is responsible for our structured notes where they settle or they do the trade or the execution for our structured notes. So they the body that makes sure that the money flows from um, Lemonway, the wallets, the investor wallets, through to the issuer or the guarantor of a structured note. So they are our settlement agent for our listed structured notes. Excellent, thank you, Rian. Just um, say one thing. Moving on. Oh, sorry. Can I just say ahead. one thing? I think it's quite important. Sometimes people don't necessarily know who those brands are. Lemonway is the biggest payments per service provider in Europe. They do billions of euros every year. They've got over two hundred crowdfunding and fintech platforms in uh, in Europe. They work with the five top banks in in Europe, and on top of that, they are regulated, as Rion's already said, by European law. Now, what's important is that we don't hold people's money. Your money is being held by Lemonway, so it's protected by European regulation as well as by the top banks in, in Europe. This is a very, very important uh, differentiator. And Capital International e equally is one of the biggest uh, payment and, and kind of financial houses in the world. And so please understand that when you're dealing with, with these partners, you know, it's, it's not kind of two guys in a garage. Um, and, and what we've done, and it's taken us a hell of a long time, uh, to do this, but rather than partnering with small companies on kind of you know foreign jurisdictions or little islands in the in the middle of nowhere, we've gone to the best providers globally in very well respected uh, regulatory environments, and that's to provide peace of mind for our investors and to provide ourselves with a global solution. It's the hard way to do it. It's much much harder than doing the easy way. But it, but it's the right way to do it for the investors long term. And I can see you got your hand up as well, Rio. Yeah. So Scott, uh, just on that, um, if we talk about Capital International, um, and it should give um, the participants and investors a lot of peace of mind, and it shows the sophistication of the wealth migrate model. So Capital International will not um, interact um, with service providers like. Um, wealth migrate if there's not a category two license involved or a discretionary portfolio manager involved, because it's only a discretionary portfolio manager like Alpha Cube that can give them the instruction to actually trade those structured notes. And because of the licensing approval with the FSCA, it provides a cat two with that ability. 
you know so if you just have a crowdfunding platform itself you will be very limited but because of the partners of a wealth migrate and the sophistication of the licenses it provides us with the ability to do a lot of things in a safe and transparent way very important and i, I mean it's, it's interesting, Ryan, you can't you can't overestimate this enough um, for what this means both for a, a global solution and more importantly mm -hmm. to the investors um, and and who they're dealing with certainly so now that we've talked through our compliance, how we're regulated, these powerhouse partners that we are um, privileged to work with and that are part of this extremely orchestrated dance to ensure that we are um, providing as much security and confidence to our investors in um, their offerings, in, in our offerings on our platform. I wanna talk a bit more specifically, Rian, with you about how your team, your investments team, selects and designates the sponsors that we work with and selects and designates the deals um, that we that we choose to put onto our, our marketplace and platform. Um, so quickly for our audience again, the general idea here is that we provide, um, there is demand from you, we search for those investments through the supply team and then put them on our platform as listings. Today we're going to be talk talking specifically about investment supply and listings with Rion. Um, before that, though, I'll kick it off to Scott to give us just a foundational understanding of our due diligence approach um, and where the origins of that came from uh, before we, we had Rion joining us. So, Scott, if you just want to touch on this. No, perfect. Look, I think many people would have heard of Clem Sunter. I'd been following him for many, many years. He's the ex-chairman of Anglo Gold and, you know, is, is the person kind of behind those, you know, well, firstly, the Cadessa and then, you know, the whole scenario planning. He's one of the top five most respected scenario planners in the world. Even the Chinese government has worked with him, et cetera. I think the point being is that for many years, I'd been watching him do his scenario planning. And I thought to myself, this is absolutely ridiculous. What's the point of just getting the theory? So I created a four dimensional model to take his scenario planning to help me make better decisions around where I invest around the world. I, I was too embarrassed to share it with him for about a year. And eventually I shared it with Clem Santa and he couldn't have been nicer about it. And he said, listen, this is really powerful. You need to share this in a book. And, and if you do, I'll, I'll endorse it. So you can see the foreword of the book there was from Clem Santa. And the book Property Going Global came out in 2014. It's, it's very much, you know, I analyzed 16 different countries on how to invest, where to invest, why to invest, the pros, the cons. I tried to make it evergreen where you can go and get all the information. But unfortunately, things change really quickly. So I always joke with people that the only person who's read my book is my mother, which is a bit of a lie because a good couple of thousand people have read it. But my point being is that, you know, go and read it if you want to. Happy to share a copy of it with anyone. However, what I realized was that I wrote the book on residential property and we took this model. We, we, we formed it into GIDS, which is the Global Investment Due Diligence System. We've got GIDS 1 for residential and then GIDS 2 for commercial. And through the years, this, the system just evolved and got better and better. And someone like Rion comes in with far more experience in the space, particularly in the regulatory compliance, the CIO space, and even the funding kind of institutional space. And it's taken what we started now, Gabby, you know, nearly a decade ago, and just taken it to a whole nother level. So it was really just a, a showing the, the life cycle journey that we've gone through in due diligence and each and every time we're looking to get better so that we can make less mistakes and, and make it safer and simpler for investors. I will say one thing though, and I wanna be very clear when it comes to due diligence. At no point are we taking direct and full responsibility for the investment. We are a marketplace. We do best to provide the right information and the right partners, but the ultimate responsibility still comes down to the investor. And that's why the last chapter in my book, I shared all the mistakes that I've made. I've been investing since 1999. And you know it's really important that investors go in with their eyes open. But what we're trying to share with you is all the work we're doing behind the scenes to help you get the right information so you can make the right decisions. Scott, yeah, I, I want to anchor or, or echo that. Um, I mean, our, our purpose is uh, to find quality deals in our opinion, act always in the best interest of investors and to do, do the best research and due diligence that we can do to allow investors to make um, informed decisions. 
Um, but the ultimate decision uh, lies with the investor. We're not providing advice. If I can get back to legislation, we're simply providing an intermediary service where we're linking a deal with an investor. And providing. Absolutely. And, and, and on that, let's look. Oh, go for it, Scott. No, I was just saying, sorry, there's a bit of a delay between us, but providing all the right information. So again, you know, what the hardest part for, for people investing around the world and having helped thousands of people do this is two things. One is getting the right information and two is the right partners. Our job is to try and provide people with the right information and secondly, the right partners, then they can make those decisions. Exactly. And what we do through our, through our sponsor and deal due diligence process is to try to make sure that we are presenting as much information to our investor community as possible to make the most educated decision for themselves. Um, so with that, Rian, if we can just talk uh, more specifically about our sponsors. What is a sponsor in this context? And I know this only looks like three bullet points, but this is something that I actually consolidated down from that mind map that you sent me that we'll look at in just a minute for all of the different touch points that go into um, both selecting, vetting, and ensuring that a sponsor is of the quality um, that, that we need or, and expect for, for our community. So if you can just touch on this, this sponsor designation process for us, um, that would be wonderful. Gabby, thank you. Yeah, so just maybe on your first point, the sponsor in our world is um, an entity, a company that's a jockey for us, uh, i.e. they bring deals to the table. And they, um, they are very important in the sense that typically the sponsor also manages the special purpose vehicle or the structure within which um, a deal is housed. So not only do they find and source opportunities for us to invest in, but they play a critical role in managing um, that deal. And they play a very important role in the successful outcome. Um, of such a deal. And um, I will touch on that a bit later again. So um, if I can just start by um, the key point to the entire due diligence process is to identify good quality sponsors. Because if we can identify good quality sponsors, it means that by default, we will get good quality and consistent deals for our investors to consider and invest in. So to start off with how we look or search for these, in the, um, these sponsors, the first thing is we look at our current portfolio composition. So Scott has mentioned that diversification is key. So we are continuously looking to provide diversified exposure to the globe, i.e. UK, Europe, the US, a combination between income and capital growth deals and so on. So by looking at the portfolio of what we're offering, we're identifying additional um, areas where investors can invest in so that they can obtain um, diversification. And of course, we listen to our community, our investors, our members to understand what they need, where they see opportunities and so on. But hold, um, watch the space. Um, we are working on what we call an investment thesis where we will be um, putting out a roadmap of where we believe investors should be invested and in which asset classes. So in other words, within property, you get multifamily, you get commercial, you get, um, 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 you get medical suites, medical offices, and so on. So what we are working on is to do research and out of that research, it points us in a direction where we need to be invested in. And then we go and look for quality sponsors in that area. Uh, furthermore, once we've identified potential sponsors, we have what we call vital signs. So think of it, it's a hurdle that a sponsor needs to be able to jump through before we even start looking at them. Um, and... Um, so once a sponsor meet those minimum criteria or their vital signs, then we go what we do a scoping report. So it's a basic report of the sponsor where we then decide, do we believe 
that this sponsor qualify to go into further investigation of the due diligence. And once we've made the decision that we would like to um, proceed with the sponsor, we have an introduction, an introductory meeting with that sponsor to understand their model. And more importantly, do we believe they are a fit for the platform? Because in the end, our investors need to have trust in faith in that sponsor. Um, I see there's a question uh, that's been asked, when will this investment thesis be available, uh, Gabby? Uh, we're working very hard to get it out um, still the second quarter, uh, but be sure that Gabby and her sales let you know when that is available. And it's something that we, that we are very, very excited about. Right then, um, once we now said that we believe we can work with the sponsor, we do a due diligence. And what is quite important is that we have, after we received information from that sponsor, we have a further conversation or an interview with that uh, sponsor, where we ask them follow-up questions to understand their business, their model, their niche, and also to discuss potential risks or flags that we've identified. And the key to that is, is to see how we can, is it a risk? And if it is, how can we manage that risk? And more importantly, to almost put um, um, during the process in place to make sure that we keep our eye on these risks that we've identified. Once we've done with the due diligence report, it goes to our investment committee and the investment committee then makes um, uh, considers the due diligence and a decision is made. And can I just say that uh, we need a majority vote. And in certain cases where there's a strong feeling that a sponsor will not fit the bill, there could be a veto vote. So it is a majority that we make in terms of our sponsors. Definitely. And if I can just share this next screen and talk through and show this audience specifically all of the different considerations that go into our due, due diligence process and those due diligence reports that you um, just touched on, Rian. So these are all, these are just some of the many facets that we consider when analyzing um, and considering a potential sponsor to, to, to join our, our ecosystem. And I mean, these are quite extensive. I don't know, Rian, if there's anything in particular that you wanna point out and, and speak to here, because I know that each and every one of these tends to take quite a bit of energy and time from your team to ensure that, um, that, that we are really getting to the root of who the sponsor is and that they are going to be the best partner for us and for our investors longer, longer term. Um, Scott, I see you've got your hand on um, up. So maybe if you just want to go first and then I will uh, just address some key, key, key points here. No, perfect. I think, look, there's a question come up, who's on the investment committee? And I know that uh, Gabby's going to bring that up just now. Um, I'm one of the people that sits on the investment committee and I you know, have been amazed by the quality of information, the quality of due diligence, the amount of stress testing that's done, including going and checking records, um, you know, checking um, the internet, um, going into detail, real detail, looking for references, bank references, financial references. I am. Um, I keep uh, hassling Rion and his team, saying, "Please, can we share these extensive reports with um, with the public, with investors, so that they can make the decisions?" And you know, he's uh, you know said on numerous occasions, "We're not able to because we get them to sign NDAs, we sign NDAs, which are non-disclosure agreements, where they are giving us." You know that they, 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 you know, to be facetious, but they're lifting up their skirts to show us all their different details. So, and obviously, we can't make that public. It is always a challenge for us between us doing that level of information and providing it for people so that they too can make, um, you know, informed decisions, and then also respecting our partners. And it's a very fine line. But I just wanted to say, I really truly wish that we could share it because the level of work that the team does is phenomenal. Uh, Scott, thank you for that. Um, so if I can just touch on one or two things. Um, so if you look at top right corner where it says established entity, um, you will see one of the components there is financial discipline and soundness. Um, something we feel very strong about is to understand how a sponsor in their own company approach their financials. So we want to understand um, 
when do you need to submit financials? Was it submitted on time? When do you do management accounts? Is it up to date? And the reason for that is, if a sponsor doesn't have the discipline in their own company to deal with their financials, if they are managing the special purpose vehicles that the properties are housed in, that our investors invest in, why will their approach to financials be different? So it is, it, is, it is very important for us to make sure that they've got financial discipline, but more importantly, financial soundness. So in other words, are they solvent? Are they liquid? And the reasons for that is, we need to limit the risk of misappropriation of funds. You know, it's very simple to move money around, you know, if, he, if there's no financial soundness. So that's something that we really try to understand and do a lot of work on. Um, a further point is that we don't like to deal with generalists. We want to work with specialists in a specific niche. By that, we mean they either only focus, let's say, on leaseback industrial, or they focus only on multifamily, or they only focus on medical sweeters, or they only maybe focus on a, in a specific geographic region. Because in the end, if you're a specialist, you've got the level of detail and attention and understanding to that specific um, asset class. Then um, in terms, if you go to the top left-hand corner where it says team, we are dealing in many cases with boutique companies. By that we mean it is small, a core team of specialists, a small core team of partners. But what we do is if the team is small by numbers, we make sure that we understand that that team has got the depth or the reach to cover all the aspects down the supply chain in terms of that asset class they're offering to us and our investors. And also, it is quite important to us to make sure that a specific partner or a specific person doesn't have a conflict of interest. In other words, they push deals they like or they push deals which they might have an interest with. Or, or in. So what we're there doing is we ideally would like, for example, that the acquisition team and the investment committee are separate. Or if there is decision making that there's a majority decision making, or how does the voting work? To make sure then that we prevent a conflict of interest and that everybody is aligned with the interests of our investors. And for example, if I can just add that, we prefer a sponsor to invest money with on an equal basis with our investors. Because if they have skin in the game, they will act in your best interest as well. And then the only other thing that I just want to mention is um, in terms of track record. Um, we do a lot of testing and stress testing and reasonability testing in terms of a sponsor's track record. So, of course, it must, they must have an appealing track record in terms of IRR and cash on cash, but we make sure to understand that any of the deals go wrong and to understand why did it happen and what did you do in terms of your process to prevent it. And let's say that we see a few deals where the return IRR is 16%, cash on cash is 8 but there's a deal with an outlier where the return was 4%. We need to understand why is there an outlier and why there is a deviation in return? Because in the end, we're trying to have a high probability of achievement of the returns that we post on um, the deal platform. Um, Gabby, yeah, and I think that's just a few things that I wanted to highlight in the DD process. Can I, can I reiterate what Rian said there? There's three things that are so critical. One is that the partners have been in a space for a long time. We aim for 10 years or more to a niche focus. The second is that they actually put their own money in the deal. So Rion mentioned skin in the game, but it's that they've got their own money in the deal because the thing that I've learned having done this for 20 plus years is if their money has been treated in the same way as your money, then you've got a much better chance of getting a, a favorable outcome sustainably together. And the third and most important principle is the word alignment. And, and what, what we do with alignment is that we'd make sure that the investors 
ourselves and their partners are aligned for long-term results. If we were getting paid a 15% commission, then we would be incentivized to sell you rubbish because it wouldn't be you know, aligned with your long-term objectives. If the partner was making all their money up front, and, and then they, they wouldn't be aligned with the investors. And alignment is absolutely key to long-term success and sustainability. And every th single thing that Rion has said is actually aiming towards long-term alignment. And at the end of the day, if the investors are successful in our business, everything else will take care of itself. Uh, Scott, and, and um, I, I can applaud that. And also, um, apart from skin in the game, um, in terms of own capital, some of our sponsors got a return hurdle. So in other words, the project must reach a certain minimum return before they start participating in any upside, which is a further indication of alignment. Yeah. And that includes us. We don't make any money exactly. until our investors have made money. So our entire fee resonates around, around alignment. And, and again, it's not an assets under management fee where we make money, whether you lose money or, or make money. We only make money when you make money. This Absolutely. Gabby, yep, sorry. No, I was going to say, and to, to help our investors understand that background and that work that goes into assessing our sponsors and then designating them, we've created sponsor designations that speak specifically to some of these key components. Um, most, most prominently, it is the management experience of the leadership team within the sponsors group. Um, the operating age for the for the sponsor themselves, the, the organization themselves, and their assets under management. Uh, so when you log into our platform, you will see under any deal card, the sponsor designation specifically for that sponsor, if they are tenured, if they are established, developing, or emerging. And again, this is to better inform you as the investor to make sure that you are confident and fully educated in the decision that you are making for yourself uh, in whatever offering you choose to invest in on our platform. Uh, Gabby, and if I, if I can just add uh, to that. Um, so we find some sponsors might have management experience, but they broke away, for example, and they started a new entity, which is maybe five years old, um, just as an example. So what we then do is we do a lot of work when we look at the track record to see is that track record relevant. So in other words, it doesn't mean we are working with a team with lots of management experience, but they go into a different niche. Then that track record means nothing. So if a company is, I don't want to say recently established, but it's a fledgling. We look at things like growth dynamics. In other words, how did your revenue grow? How did your assets under management grow? And so on, to make sure that one, the track record is relevant and there's underlying growth dynamics to support that business. Absolutely. Now we have a question here that asks if it mentions on the deal card, whether the sponsor is also investing money into the deal. And I think this just is something to reiterate that it is, it is a, a requirement that the sponsor invest into every deal that we offer on our platform. Um, and I believe Scott or Brian, if, if you can give the percentage that we look for that the sponsor is actually directly investing into the deal. I'm happy to talk to yeah. you. So Gabby, we, uh, sorry, Scott, I see you where uh, I could see your lips moving. So I'll give you first go. Oh, look, it, 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 it changes and it's relevant. You know, it's interesting because people get caught up in percentages. And I remember, you know, you know, people saying, oh, do they put 10 or 50% in? Sometimes it can be low as 1%. All that we're trying to do is that we actually want the sponsor to be putting an equal amount of money as pretty much the top investor. So we've tended to find that if, an, if a sponsor's putting in somewhere between 100 dollars and $500,000 in that ballpark, then they are generally got more sweat in the game, more equity in the game than, than many of our investors. And, and I think all that we're trying to you know, use is a reasonability test. Now, again, I want to be clear, these are the systems that I used over many, many years. And I know that Rion has taken this to a whole nother level. So I probably should have spoken second. <laughs> yeah, Scott, so um, um, if I look at our current uh, sponsors, uh, between five to 10%, um, and some sponsors go up between 15 to 20%. Um, in terms of, um, in terms of um, capital in deal. And also quite important, we make sure that all 
equity classes and equity holders are treated the same. So it's not that if a sponsor put money in, they've got preferential rights or whatever the case might be um, over our um, investors as equity holders. That is something that cannot be um, overemphasized, Rion. You know, if I've learned the hard way where we've made mistakes, both myself with my own money and, you know, even other investors, is where we've found that we were second class citizens in a deal. And when things went badly, and it's amazing in England, Australia, and America how clever these structures are. And it takes real, some real financial engineering to make sure that you're not a second class citizen. Um, and at the end of the, the, you know, the, the totem pole when it's time to pay returns. Excellent. We're going to jump into our deal selection and designation process just now. But while we're discussing SPV representation, um, can I, I do, we do have a question here about if investors can have SPV representation? Um, Scott, I, do you want to speak to the the anchor investor opportunity that we have for our deals um, and just share that with our community? Yeah, perfect. I think. Anchor Investor is something we came up with right from the very beginning with the very first commercial medical deal back in August 2014. We had two Anchor Investors and they put in a million dollars each and one of them actually sat on the SPV representing uh, not only themselves and their own interests but the rest of the investors. So we've created an Anchor opportunity. We, we, we believe that it's, um, it's worked for us through all these years and there's two reasons why it works really well. One is that if someone's investing significant capital, they want to be able to have a say in what's happening. So they actually sit uh, as a director on the SPV. And two is that the other investors actually like it because the investors along with Wealth Migrate have a, um, a, a seat at the table as they call it. Uh, there's a third thing that's really important is that if someone's prepared to come in as an anchor investor, not only because they're putting in significant capital, but, but because they are participating as the anchor investor, we also dramatically reduce the fees. In fact, there's no fees uh, to put in perspective. And why are we doing this? We're enticing um, anchor investors to be able to participate. Uh, they, they effectively create the cornerstone to allow that investment to take place. It's good for them and it's good for all the other investors and it's good for the supplier because it immediately shows a solid commitment up front, which allows everyone else to participate. It's very much a win-win. It's worked highly successfully and we're very glad to be bringing it back. And I think we can talk more about that at the end when we have our q and I'm just mindful of the time and I do want to discuss specifically how we select and designate our deals because it's the, the crux of, of what we do here. Um, Rian, if you can just walk us through specifically the deal um, identification, selection and, and designation process that your team goes through. Yes, thank you, Gabby. Um, so I think the key point is we're trying to find sponsors that can bring us consistent supply of deals. Uh, because there is such a lot of work being done to approve a sponsor, we want to partner with sponsors. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, so we are continuously reaching out to sponsors to, uh, to, to determine are there new, deal, new deals coming. Uh, furthermore, um, to understand what we call the deal pipeline. Uh, because we can plan in, um, in terms of that diversification and so on and so forth. So once a sponsor comes to us and they say to us that, um, fine, there's a deal, what we then do is we take initial information from them and we conduct our own research. And I'll give you an example. Um, we had a sponsor that we recently onboarded. They spoke about cost per uh, square meter to build, or they spoke about potential... Um, 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 exit uh, cap rates. Um, they spoke about um, rentals in relation to other areas. And our team goes and we do a reasonability test of those figures. The idea is not to second guess them, but we just need to make sure that we're comfortable in the numbers that's presented because that could impact the returns that is promised. Um, once we've done this initial analysis, we set up an interview with the sponsor, where we then go and we further ask questions, um, things that we don't understand, or further clarifications. Once that is done, we provide a final due diligence deal report to the investment committee. And I think what is quite important there is, which could be of interest to our investors, is where we do a synopsis. 
So we, we would start off to say, what's the fundamentals of the deal? In other words, why do we believe this deal could be successful and result in the returns that we expect? So in other words, what, do you, what are those supporting factors that support the deal to be successful? We go into the positives, we go into the risks, and we also then do a rationale. So Mr. or Mrs. Investor, why do you need to consider this investment? And why do we believe it's a good investment? And then we make a recommendation to the investment committee for consideration and decision. And then what is quite important, if the investment committee approves a deal, then we re-engage with the sponsor to make sure that we can at, the, uh, at least get a chunk of that deal. I can tell you we are dealing with sponsors that if they put the deal on the platform a week later, it's sold out. And it's just not practical from our processes and Gabby's processes as revenue and sales to do that. Um, so we need to make uh, ensure that there's capacity, but more importantly, that we respect our sponsors, that the period we're gonna raise money in, that that's aligned with their timeline that they require the money. It's very important that because it builds trust with our sponsors. But then um, as Scott has indicated um, previously, um, you know, um, about SPV representation and things like that and the importance of that. Uh, a total different focus then is to do deal tracking during the life cycle. So in other words, what we do is we provide a summary of when do we expect distributions and what must it be? And we do a forecasted return. Then my team go and they monitor. So we're expecting this money that we receive it. Is it in line of what's been expected? Because the last thing we want is that money need to be paid on date X and we only receive money two months or three months later because that's a flag or we need to start charging interest. So from the deal monitoring point of view, there's deal reporting, not only to US investor, but more importantly, a flag report to the investment committee. In other words, when there is a big deviation or an unacceptable deviation in what's been declared and what's been expected, it comes to the investment committee to make a decision do we need to reach out to the sponsor? Do we need to understand why, what is the case? And is it a risk? Do we need to address it with our sponsors directly? And then of course, in the end, when a deal um, closes, there's a deal exit strategy that's defined by the investment committee and we make sure that it's executed properly. So it's not only Gary, that we approve a sponsor and then we give a sponsor card blanche. Our key focus is, we need to find good quality sponsors. But then we do a second level of due diligence on the deal. But when the deal is live, we monitor that deal closely to make sure that we get what we've expected. And if we identify issues that we identified early and that we can engage with sponsors to address it. Absolutely. And I think that speaks to why we are so um, critical of our sponsors at the beginning when we are completing our due diligence on them is because this is something that is more much more of a marriage a sponsor we are with them through the entirety of that deal and that deal can be anywhere from three years to to seven years in length so when we are committing to a sponsor we are committing to um, quite an extended amount of time to working with them through the lifetime of every single deal that we offer with them, um, offer through them to uh, to that end. I just want to touch on quickly our designation of um, of deals specifically. We have risk categories that our investors can see on our platform, um, and just want to speak quickly to what those uh, risk categories are. So after you're looking on a deal card um, on our platform and you see that a deal is rated as a value add. What does that mean for you that every deal goes through during that due diligence? Um, the risk category is essentially assessed. So is the risk commensurate to the return that is being offered? And based upon that, a uh, risk category and a designation is, um, it, it is given to, to that specific deal. Uh, Rian, I don't know if there's anything else you want to touch on here um, 
specifically uh, related to our, our risk categories? Yes, uh, Gabby, um, I think a danger for investors is to simply, by lack of a better word, chase the highest potential return deals. An investor must go and say, what is my anticipated return for the risk that I'm taking? So in other words, why we are publishing or putting these risks on is for an investor to gauge what type of risk and I'm taking on for the return that I'm achieving. And, and that's the purpose of this. It's just to give the investor a feel of a risk adjusted type of return. Excellent. Now we've talked so much about Philips want to flag an upcoming deal that we are extremely excited about. This is coming very, very soon, as in shortly this week. Um, Rian, I don't know if you want to speak to, to this deal with uh, Feldman Equities, um, the, the nature of it, the, the sponsor categorization, um, but we'd love to hear your thoughts here on why this deal was selected specifically and what, uh, what excites you about it. Yes. Yes. Um, so first of all, Feldman uh, specializes in um, offices, but more importantly, what they do is they take an office block and they do certain tenant improvements um, so that it makes the property more um, attractive to potential um, um, tenants. So in this case, we're talking about a, a, um, a class office space already. But what Feldman will be doing here is they will be putting in other amenities, for example, a gym. They will be putting in a social area for staff. They will be putting in a business and conference center. So in other words, they're making these, let's call it around the edge changes that speaks to lifestyle um, of tenants, for example, which then makes these buildings more attractive. Um, furthermore, um, why we like this deal a lot is that given its position. So um, first of all, Interstate 95 is very close by, so it's accessible. Secondly, there's lots of um, a parking space adjacent to um, um, an underground. So in other words, once again, it speaks to things like people that do not want to be, um, how can I put it, um, exposed to COVID and the, and the dangers of COVID, they can drive themselves and there's sufficient parking space. Uh, furthermore, there's lots of relocation from New York and so on to this specific area. As you can see, it's uh, Fort L uh, Lauderdale because of quality of life, first of all, but more importantly, they can get good quality office space at about 30 to 35 percent less expensive or cheaper than what they can get in um, New York, for example. Uh, furthermore, what I think is very important is why we like this deal, especially is it's almost like Santa, if I can put it like that uh, to South Africans. It's a very high sought after area. Uh, for example, um, Microsoft's got offices there. So what we believe is a key exit strategy is because of the profile of the area, we will get an institutional buyer to buy this property, a pension fund, an insurance company, and so on. Um, and, and that makes this deal very attractive to us. And also, if I can just say the following, is that there's been, we've done a lot of work on the risk of office space given COVID-19 and um, remote working. Now, just to give an idea, Feldman's got technology which they put into buildings where they clear and clean the air. So that's a first stick to us. Secondly, they believe what's going to happen is that people will return back to offices or where there's cubicles, they will be working further apart. So in other words, we are getting more rent for every square meter of rentage. So we are very confident that their model and the actions addresses the risk of COVID and the risk of uh, the impact of remote working. Furthermore, they've got a very diversified tenant profile. So if they've got people in financial services, ID, uh, IT, um, legal firms, and they will also be targeting tenants 
where human interaction is key. For example, advertising, IT. They people need to talk to one another. They need to be in um, 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 within an office. So Feldman Equities, they definitely tenured. Um, they've got lots of experience in office space. That's what they do. But more importantly, their niche is this value adding amenities. So we just felt that it's within their niche and the execution strategy suits the strategy they previously applied in generating returns for investors. I think one extra thing though, if I've ever learned anything about investing is that uh, when there's blood on the streets, it's a good investment opportunity. And right now, office buildings, you can buy at uh, very good cap rates because of COVID. And you know, five years from now, people people look back and go, wow, you got such a good deal. It's like, yes. Uh, and again, that's why you stick to a partner that's got billions and billions under management, decades of experience. And this is not the first time they've seen a change in the economic cycles. And, and Scott, also what is quite important, um, they specifically mentioned that it's much better for them to buy and renovate than to build new. You know, so in essence, we're already picking up um, a discount, if I can put it like that, between 30 to 35 percent in terms of that strategy. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. And, and that speaks again to the, the supply partners or the sponsors that we partner with because they have that expertise and we are simply leveraging that expertise to ensure that we're providing the best um, deals, the best offerings to our partners uh, through them. Great, uh, Rian, there's been a lot of talk and a lot of questions in the chat uh, about your team. Who are they? This is obviously a very uh, significant team to our business. So I wanted to highlight here who some of these people are. Unfortunately, I could not find a picture of Kelly, uh, but if you wanna speak specifically to, to your Small But Mighty team um, and, and how they, they work with you to, to deliver everything that we've discussed today so far. Yes, yeah, so thanks for that. So the investment committee consists of myself, uh, Lyndon Booth, which is um, head of our global products. Um, and then, of course, um, um, I think Mr. Property in terms of uh, Scott, uh, who understands uh, property thoroughly. Uh, so we're the investment committee and we are the decision making body. Um, so two of three of us need to approve a sponsor or a deal for us to proceed. Then um, in terms of uh, Kelly, Kelly is responsible to reach out to our sponsors to do the account management and the relationship management with our sponsors. And when a deal is implemented to make sure that there's proper coordination between the sponsors, the deal team, and the sales and the revenue and platform team that a deal goes smoothly. Then um, Carlise is responsible for the deal monitoring, the deal tracking, the deal reporting. So she's key to make sure through, in, through the life cycle of the deal that we monitor our sponsors and deals properly. Uh, Jing, um, he's responsible for our um, sponsor identification and for, for doing scoping reports. Then also we recently um, appointed an intern which will um, assist us with the investment thesis bit. And then on the edges, we've got a lady by the name of Megan, who is responsible for our SPV management. And we also got a lady by the name of Ruth, who is responsible to be almost like the gel or the link between our supply team and our demand team to make sure that the right story and a good story gets over to um, uh, to our investors. So those are the key parts um, of um, um, my team. But like any other business, we are cross-functional teams. So we rely on other expertise, for example, Cisco, who is responsible for our client due diligence. So she makes sure that clients are KYC, KYB, and things like that. So we do rely on other team members within the company as, um, as well. But this is our core team that's um, got the responsibility to ensure we can act in the best interest of our clients. 
and hopefully one day, Rion, one day. we will be bringing in um, the social proofing component, which will be the power of the community to add an extra uh, level to, to this whole thing, which is something you and I and the team are discussing behind the scenes. No, definitely. And, and, and I think, um, Scott, what is quite important is, you know, through our reporting um, and our deal monitoring, you know, we try to inform our investors of projects, deals, what's happening, you know, so that they can also be informed throughout that journey, the life journey of a deal. Wonderful. So to sum that all up, this has been the culmination of um, quite a few years of, of work and, and speaking to that is our track record that you can view here. Um, you can also see on our uh, main website, uh, the, the numerous awards that we've won, I think most recently also earned uh, um, an award for uh, top 100 fintechs in Africa, um, specifically in the crowdfunding space. Um, this is something that we are passionate about as a team. And as you can tell from Rian's uh, time today, hearing all of the work and sweats that his team puts in to ensure that we are delivering this type of opportunity, um, these types of opportunities and offerings to you as our investor base. Uh, with that, I would love to introduce um, a, an investor that has been tried and true with us, Andrew Cooper. Um, so Scott and Andrew would love to, one, Andrew, thank you for joining us this evening, but kick it over to, to Scott and Andrew just to tell us about your, um, how you met and what your relationship has been with, with Wealth Migrate and your experience has been with Wealth Migrate um, as an investor. Hi, Hi everyone. everyone. Evening, Hi. evening, everyone. How are you doing, Andrew? Thanks so much for being online. Gabby, if you wouldn't mind chucking up that picture there, which I think is also awesome. Uh, just uh, it, it shows Andrew uh, off in America with, with Henny. Andrew, from my perspective, firstly, thank you very much for being online. It's really awesome to have you. I believe that you know we can go through all the theory, but actually real practical examples is extremely powerful. Tell us just from your perspective, why did you want to start investing offshore um, in the beginning? What was your reason, basically? What was your why? Look, I think we all know um, as South Africans that uh, our money is going backwards in global terms. Um, I started a spreadsheet that uh, basically went back to, to March of 1982 when the dollar was one, uh, one rand per one US dollar. And if you add 7% to that every, every year, Right up to this year, you'll actually get to right where we are, which is uh, 14 Rand. Uh, obviously, it goes up and down, but the point is that we are losing value against the dollar. So I, I had um, industrial property and residential property, which I thought I'd never sell. And when I did the numbers and saw that we're losing 7% a year against a global currency and only getting 8% in, in, in uh in an increase in rental, it made sense for me to, to liquidate whatever I could and get it over to earn a, a real currency um, and protect my wealth. So, yeah, it's, um, we all have to do that. And uh, the sooner we do it, the better. Andrew, talk to us about your story because, you know, we've um, we followed a path together for a long time. And you were very similar to me where, you know, you, you did it in what I will refer to as the more traditional route, which is where you flew over, went on an airplane, kind of set up an LRC in a bank account, et cetera. But talk to us about your journey from you decided you wanted to invest offshore. How did you do it? What, what did you do next? And, and what were some of your concerns? You know, everyone that's thinking about it at some level is, is nervous, you know? Sure. So look, I mean, um, I educated myself. You know, uh, I met you um, for the first time in about 2014, I think. And at that stage, sorry, it was 2012, March 2012. It was uh, this after the GFC and um, residential property in Florida, I think, was was really, really cheap. And, and the, you could buy apartments for $50,000. And I thought, no, this is too good to be true. So I didn't do anything. I could idiot. I should have. <laughs> But hindsight is the perfect science. But I basically just educated myself. Every single webinar, every single uh, seminar that came up, I went to, I learned more. And I, I got to the point where I had to take action because I knew I had to take action. And that's when I, when I went overseas 
uh, to physically go and view the properties that, that, that I was hearing about. But obviously in these times, we are not able to do that, but even more so with Zoom and with, um, with all the technology that it's about, you actually don't have to spend the money and, uh, and travel overseas. If you have faith in the team that you're dealing with, and I have faith in Wealth Migrate, um, and, and like Wealth Mi I have faith in Wealth Migrate, they have faith in their team on the ground in a particular country, in the particular state, which is incredibly, incredibly important. You can go and sell uh, anything to anyone and then um, and not actually make good on, on your investment. But if you have a good team behind you, you have a good track record, then you can have faith in them. And um, you don't actually have to physically be there to go and view. So, yeah, I mean, everything online, COVID has is, is, uh, exacerbated. And uh, I would encourage everyone to to educate themselves on, on what's out there and what's available on this platform. Andrew, just my last question to you is that um, I sometimes I sometimes find it weird because, you know, five or six years feels like a lifetime. And what I mean by that is that, you know, people like yourself and myself, you know, would, would fly on an airplane and would go set up structures and bank accounts and the whole thing would take months and it would be, you know, incredibly time consuming and expensive and, and now you can go onto the platform of wealth migrate and you know on the assumption you've kyc yourself and funded your wallet you can literally invest in portugal england you know or sorry portugal europe england america and you know there's even a deal we we, we, we hopefully bring on soon in australia and my point being is that you can do it all in like less than a minute and it's quite bizarre because you know i've had um great dealings with your son that is currently at university. And he's like, well, this is obvious. Like, this is where the world's going. And it's weird because for someone like your son, they won't even know all the hardship and the pains we went to when we were investing in, in kind of traditional, you know, residential or commercial property. And I mean, this is a picture of you outside a commercial property. I think that's medical three by, if I can see from the picture well enough. Yeah, and, um, you know, which is, which is feels like ions ago in 2016. And yet it's only five years ago. And it shows you how quickly things have changed, you know? No, sure. I mean, you know, we, we had to go to the States. We had to open up bank accounts once we had the LLC. I must tell everyone I've had four bank accounts closed by the U.S. authorities, the banking authorities, because uh, of various reasons. Um, that's all gone now. We don't need to invest $100,000 like we used to. That was the minimum investment. Um, you can get online. You can KYC yourself. You can uh, fund your wallet, and you can invest at the tap of a tap of a finger. I mean, that's that was the dream. The dream is here, and um, we can enable everyone to do it now. Andrew, my last comment, and I'm I'm conscious of your time because we we've, we've run over, and I'm I'm conscious we're running late with with yourself and with everyone else online. My last question is to, you know, you started, you did the research, you back in 2012 now, so nearly a decade ago. You saw that the rand was devaluating against um, a, a currency seven percent. And again, just by the way, it it doesn't matter whether you're in India or China or anywhere in the emerging world, or even by the way, the U.S. dollar possibly against other currencies. You you need to be a global citizen. But once you've figured out your why, any closing thoughts for someone that's sitting in that same situation where they've got that uncertainty, they've got that anxiety, they know they need to something do something, but they're not sure what to do next. Any, any advice based on your last decade's worth of experience? Yeah, you've got to be comfortable with who you're dealing with. So I would, if I was a new person looking to invest through Wealth Migrate, I'd reach out uh, to the community um, and, and make uh, relationships, find out uh, people's experiences. I'm happy to talk to anyone who wants to phone me or WhatsApp me or whatever. Um, I, I talk straight. There's no... Uh, talking in circles here, it is what it is. And I've had a fantastic uh, relationship with Wealth Migrate. All the deals that, that, that I've invested in have, have come to fruition. The cash and cash yields, the capital growth. Um, and and the, in these days, um, you have to be very sure of who you're dealing with because there are charlatans out there who want to steal your money. And I can comfortably recommend Wealth Migrate as a trusted partner. So. You know, as, as Nike says it, just do it. You have to do it. 
Awesome. Well, Andrew, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And uh, we, we appreciate uh, your support uh, through the journey. And we look forward to a long and fruitful journey ongoing, um, you know, going forward. So thank you very much for your time tonight. Pleasure, guys. Take care. Keep well. Cheers. Thank Bye you, then. Andrew. Ciao. Uh, just mindful of the time, Scott, can we quickly touch on next steps and then get to Q&A because we have one final really interesting question that I do want to address um, from, from Francis O'Neill here. Steps. I'll do next steps very quickly. Andrew mentioned coming to, you know, coming to meet us, to, you know, shaking our hands, meeting us face to face. Uh, next steps are we've got this breakfast. So if you want to just change the slide there, Gabby, we've got the breakfast coming up around the country in Cape Town, in Johannesburg and in Durban. And there is a website that I'm going to put uh, in the uh, chat box uh, for you quickly so that you can all go and see it there. Actually, Gabby, if you don't mind, do you mind if I steal the screen back quickly? Um, no, go for it. Go for it. What, then I can just go straight to the website. Uh, so let me just uh, get the right screen up here. Where's it gone now? I've lost the breakfast. <laughs> Give me two seconds. I will get it up for you. And um, and what we're basically going to be doing in the breakfast here, up. So I've got it for you. So let me steal the screen back. And you can see here the breakfast link. So it's online. Walt Migrate Offshore Investor Breakfast. So if you're watching the recording, you can put that in, and I'll put it in the chat box for everybody. And you can see it there. What you're going to get at the breakfast is that there's going to be a number of different speakers. Um, I'm going to be running through the first section. So the first section will be practical, uh, sorry, theoretical, and there's going to be 10 critical lessons. So the secrets to preserving and growing wealth, why you should invest beyond the, your domestic borders, how to choose the right countries, the right partners and the right opportunities, how to invest in residential and commercial in England, Australia, America, Europe and South Africa, how the top 1% understand risks of offshore investing and manage them, the key strategy used by the top 1% to create financial freedom, become a global citizen, including looking at foreign partnerships, uh, foreign citizenship, sorry. Um, how do you manage legal structures, bank accounts, tax processes, et cetera? How to create a personal investment plan, whether you go $100 or a million dollars, what Wealth Migrate does, um, how our regulation works, our compliance, our structuring, and even our fees, how do we make money? And most importantly, how do you achieve peace of mind um, so that you can create a life you want and, and purposeful impact? So that's the session before breakfast up to 10 o'clock. We'll then have a tea break and then we go into a practical session. And we find that the practical session is actually of more value to people because this is where we go through the platform. We go through the available investment opportunities. We explain how the returns work, how tax efficient um, you, know, you can be. We've got some consultants coming from um, tax consulting. They're actually on the webinar next week. So I highly recommend you come along to that webinar. And, and that's where you know, tax is always personalized. Um, align and, and learn about the next steps with regards to your financial planning. And then we find the Q&A is the most valuable of that entire process. So you can go along here, you can reserve your tickets. You can go to the three different cities. You can see the testimonials from Dr. Dolph DeRuis and Clem Sunter. If you go to the city you want, you can literally book it all you know, through um, Quicket. Would you charge a quick fee? Um, you can go down and see the resources here. There's a whole bunch of resources that are available to you. Um, how to do your KYC in your personal capacity, your company, and even a trust. And um, just by the way, why do we charge $199? Um, at the end of the day, we do not make money out of running events. Uh, Gabby, you can come back to your slides. Uh, we make, but, but because of COVID, we're actually limited to 30 people uh, per event. So we just want to have quality people there. We do want to just put a small fee down um, so that we actually know that people are going to be committed. I believe that when people pay, they pay attention, uh, which is why we're charging a very small fee. Um, quite frankly, I'm happy to give you a, a refund if you want it. If you, if you come along for the four hours and you say it's absolute rubbish, happy to give you your money back. It's not about making money, but we just don't want 50 people booking and then, you know, five turn up. Then the next thing is that if you want to talk to a wealth consultant, you know, we're a, we're a platform, we're a digital platform with a human heart. Uh, reach out to, to Fritz or Alex. You've got their details here on the screen. They're happy to hold your hand. We like to believe that it's the private banking of using our platform. Next slide. And we to the Q&A, Gabby. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. So we have um, quite a few questions here. I think I can see some of them. Um, Scott, I believe.
obviously you can see some of those Q&A questions as well, but what I really wanted to address here was um, from Francis O'Neill specifically on um, investing in our platform. So as an investor, you would deposit your funds into a Lemonway wallet. Now we do transfer that into US dollars. Uh, there's a question here about how then are we diversifying into currency like euros um, or dollars or Australian dollars? Uh, Rihanna or Scott, if either one of you can address, uh, address that question. Oh, perfect. Look, at the, at the end of the day, the reason we went with Lemonway is that they actually got uh, wallets in in pounds, in euros, in US dollars, and even Australian dollars. So the dream one day is that the investor will be able to hold multiple accounts in multiple currencies. The challenge for us is that each and every time we do that, we pay a monthly annuity fee. Um, because we pay those fees, there are no fees to investors. At the moment, the majority is in US dollars. Um, and once we've got critical mass in euros and pounds, we will, we will make those uh, wallets available. However, people are still investing and diversifying because if I take my money and I invest in Portugal, it's a European asset earning European returns. And we just do a, um, a, a SWAT, not a SWAT, what's it called? <laughs> anyway, same day transfer um, um, that day. So you are, you are riding 100% the diversification of dollars, pounds. Um, it is just an ease of use at the moment. We could, you know, we could easily pass on those fees to investors. We've chosen to make our platform have no fees so that investors are participating. And only, you know, because of that, we just need to make sure that we've got critical mass uh, when we open the European and pound wallet. Uh, Scott, yeah. So um, also um, the investors can think of it. You you speak about the Portugal Marvilla transaction. Um, there they must think of the dollars as their reporting currency. The actual exposure is to euros. Uh, for example, we also had a, a structured note uh, where we could offer it to investors previously in more than uh, US dollars. Uh, so there are from time to time opportunities like that. Um, so, 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 but, but I think if you look at the underlying asset and where it's domiciled, that gives you the diversification. Yeah. No, 100%. And again, the quality of the asset, the quality of the income is, is important. Can I suggest, Gabby, there's a couple of questions here that I just want to quick fire and go through considering the time. Please so Simi's asked, can you please elaborate on asymmetric risk uh, to reward? And, and in simple terms, Simi, I'll go through this in a lot more detail at the breakfast. I did talk about it last week, so talk, look at the recording. But in simple terms, it means, you know, most of us are taught the higher the risk, the higher the reward. Actually, the top end, top 1%, you know, institutional quality investors look for low risk, high reward. And so you want to really try and reduce your risk and increase your reward. And that's what asymmetric risk reward is. Um, and, and that's as an investor. Um, someone, uh, Mr. Anonymous has said, are there Sharia compliance investments available on the marketplace? Funny you mentioned that because we are working very hard at the moment uh, to provide an entire Sharia compliance solution. And we believe there's a huge opportunity to provide this solution around the world with less than 1% of global financial products being Sharia compliant. Can we fund our wallets with Bitcoin or cryptocurrency? Christian uh, would love to. Funny enough, we could. In 2016 and 2017 and 2018, we actually could fund. We used the system through Payfast. Really interesting. Less than 0.01% of people funded their wallets using a cryptocurrency. Um, now Lemonway has a challenge with uh, cryptocurrency um, and, and, and kind of um, Bitcoin, et cetera. So at the moment, we don't. And the reason they've got a challenge is because of their underlying banks. It is changing and it is changing fast. And as soon as we can, we'll be letting you know um, in terms of that process. We very much uh, believe in kind of blockchain and cryptocurrency, but we've got to get the timing right. And it's this balance between the new age where the world's going and complying with the old age banks that still run the system. Um, Bash has said, thank you, Rion. I'll email you with profile, which city are you based in? Uh, Rion is in Cape Town. Um, and I don't want to say this, but hopefully Rion will be at our breakfast uh, and, and certainly uh, for to meet our wealth partners. Uh, Jenny <laughs> saying, when you fund our wallet, is this considered immediately putting funds offshore? Uh, yes, Jenny. So your, your money is going into your Lemonway wallet. It's your own wallet. You're completely in control of your cash. It's a digital wallet, so you don't have to go overseas and set up a bank account. It's completely yours. You're in control of it, and your money is immediately offshore. Even if you do nothing and your money sits in your wallet, you, you, we do not charge you any fees, and so your money can literally sit offshore in a foreign currency for yourself. Um, then there's a couple of other questions that came through here on the chat box that I'd like to just um, um, refer to quickly. 
uh, boom, 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 boom. Where is it gone now? Uh, those, uh, do, 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 do. sorry, I'm just reading through all the questions. Well, while while you're looking through that, Scott, I just want to plug that while we will be um, meeting you in Cape Town, Johannesburg and uh, Durban in June, uh, next week is the final, third and final week of our webinar online series where we're going to be discussing most specifically tax, because I see a lot of questions here about tax, tax impact, how you're affected. Um, so next week, we will actually have our partner, Tax Consulting South Africa. They are one of the um, largest and um, most uh, considered technical tax advisors in the country. Um, and they will be speaking to, uh, to you, our investors in our community, specifically about how you are impacted from a tax perspective and how to be tax efficient when considering investing offshore and specifically when investing offshore through a platform like Wealth Migrate. Um, so if you are looking for some of those more technical answers, definitely RSVP for our webinar next week uh, and sign up for a breakfast or one-on-one -on -one session with us when we are on the road in June because they will also be joining us on the road in June and will be available for those um, personal conversations one-on-one uh, -on -one as well. What incentive for sponsors to get involved um, in retail investor market through crowdfunding? It's quite simple, actually. The world's changing. If you were you know, building ox wagons and cars came along and you didn't adapt, you'd go out of business. They're seeing the shift happening all over the world, the, the shift to, to, to effectively the power of the retail investor, as you're seeing all around the world. And you know, tonight's not the night, but you know, there's a whole lot of reports that's happened even in the last six months of the power of the retail investor and they want to be part of it. And they understand that they're only as good as their, as their digital track record. Equally in markets like South Africa and other emerging markets, it might be a new fad or a new way of doing it. But in America now, there's, there's platforms that are raising a quarter of a billion dollars um, every three months in the space. And so it's, it's really gone beyond um, being a fringe benefit now. It, it is mainstream. And, and, and that's why sponsors are wanting to get in part. And the other thing that's really interesting is that a bunch of the sponsors that are using those American platforms are used to reaching American investors that way. They know it works. They now want to go after global investors, but none of the American platforms can help global investors, which is where Wealth Migrate plugs the gap. Um, who of Rion's team, uh, who is part of Rion's team, as it's clear that his team has a big role and a huge responsibility in deal selection and performance monitoring? Agreed, Francis, and um, we have explained that tonight. And that is why we believe actually it, there's many different levels to this and I'm not gonna repeat that, but you know, the team is providing the right information, the right partners, the investors still, still take the ultimate responsibility. And to be fair, generally there's banks involved as well and they also are part of it. So your business is built on leverage uh, to uh, the leverage the expertise of the supply partners, very much so. You know, if I've learned one thing, you know, having invested all over the world in the last uh, 22 years, um, you're never going to be as good as your partner on the ground. And you're always going to have local expertise. As an example, in England, I bought my first house in England in 2002. I tried to buy another property two years ago in England. I could borrow at 6% financing. Now, I'm a, British, I'm a British citizen. I've had a bank account in England since 99, but I'm still deemed an expat, whereas a British person can borrow at 25 to 3%. That's 50% the cost of capital that I can borrow at. And that has a measurable impact on returns. And so by partnering with a British partner on the ground, we got a much more favorable discount. It's just, it happens over and over and over again um, in terms of the, the, the benefits of working with the partners. Um, okay, we've answered that one. Sorry, I'm just going through this. I think that covers all of our questions, but we, we've come to, I think we addressed the, the others throughout the course of the, um, the session and we're very over time. I'm at this point. Thank you so much to our attendees for your interest, for your engagement in this conversation. As you can tell we're equally passionate to call Rian a colleague and to have him as a part of our team. Thank you so much, Rian, for your time this evening, for, for joining us and uh, giving our investors a better understanding of all of the hard work that you and your team put in. Um, just so enlightening to hear and always thrilling to have our investors hear that as well. Um, Scott, as well for your time this evening, uh, you for, for your engagement and uh, answering some of the questions that we had from our, from our investors tonight. Thank Agreed. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rian. And thank you, Andrew, for sharing yeah. your experience. And as always, well done to you and your team. I think a very professional 
um, overview of, of regulation and, and due diligence. And sometimes people see that as the boring end of, of investing. It's not the excitement and whatever, but actually it's the foundation upon which this is all built. Absolutely. Wonderful. With that, have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you so much for your time. And we will see you next Wednesday at 7 p.m. for our final webinar series with Tax Consultant. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.